Okay. Our next presenter is May Luera from Metropolitan State University of Denver. Maya's mentor this summer was Alex Rugg, and Maya's topic of her oral presentation today is icing in the cockpit, mitigating the hazard of supercooled large droplets, SLD, in aviation. All right, my name is Amea Tsunueta, and I will be talking about icing in the cockpit, mitigating the hazard of supercooled large droplet in aviation. Structural icing is when ice um, attaches to the outer structure of the airplane while it's flying through the atmosphere. So the reason that an airplane flies is because it produces lift and it produces thrust. The counteracting forces of this are weight and drag. So when ice accumulates, it both increases the weight while decreasing the lift that's supposed to counteract that. It reduces the thrust while it is um, increasing the drag as well. Supercooled liquid water is the condition that airplanes have to fly through to get the structural icing. Supercooled liquid water are droplets that are below the freezing temperature, although they are still made out of liquid instead of ice. These are really unstable, and so all it takes is the disruption of an airplane to fly through for it to freeze. On this picture to the right, you can see that the right side is the leading edge of the wing, and the left side is the trailing edge. So these supercooled liquid water droplets are freezing on contact cleanly, all just on that leading edge, which disrupts the airflow minimally. Supercooled large droplets are a subset of supercooled liquid water that are above 100 microns in size. And there's a significant difference between how supercooled liquid water, small ones, and large ones interact with the airplane. The large ones, instead of freezing cleanly on contact on just the leading edge, go and run back the airframe and freeze all the way down it. And because there is so much liquid inside of these droplets, they accumulate extremely quickly and they form these icicle-like shapes along the wing. So you can see on the right this feathering-like shape, which disrupts the airflow significantly. It also is uneven and jagged, which can lead to uh, sort of peculiar aerodynamic differences, which cause um, lack of controllability. Oh, and uh, one more thing. When I talk about aviation in this, I'm referring to general aviation as in it excludes commercial airliners and military operations. So the typical SLD accident follows this general pattern. It starts with a very experienced pilot who obtains a weather briefing and then flies into the forecasted conditions anyways. This is because the forecast is not entirely accurate. It goes on the more conservative side, and so frequently it will forecast icing when there's not actually icing in the clouds. So if this experienced pilot has gone up before and these forecasted conditions come out perfectly fine, it causes this boy cries wolf sort of uh, mentality. So these pilots will then encounter SLD while they're in cruise, which very quickly increases the heaviness of the airplane, and it feels sloppy and wrong and um, generally they will keep on pushing towards their destination airport instead of finding a field to land to or a nearby airport to divert to, something along those lines, or trying to figure out a way to burn off the ice. So instead, they will attempt to maintain their altitude by increasing the throttle to full, which is as much power as they can have, while pulling back on the stick, which increases the angle between the airplane and the relative air bringing it closer to that uh, critical angle of attack, which just means that angle in which the airplane loses controllability, more or less. And that the fact that the ice is making the airplane slower, heavier, and unable to maintain altitude has it so there's only about 10 to 15 knots of margin of controllability. Eventually, the pilot will actually probably reach their destination airport 
And then when they are changing configurations of the airplane to land, that will be the tipping point for that, that aerodynamic braking and they will lose complete controllability. Um, also this picture, everybody got out safely, otherwise I would not be showing it. Um, ultimately, these accidents come down to human factors, so this is a model for that. The first one is perceptible errors, which just means you can't understand what you cannot see, and you cannot see which clouds have SLD and which clouds don't. Skill errors, this means you might not be uh, physically, technically skilled at handling the aircraft when it is iced up. There's no way to practice for that either. And then decision errors, which are formed by the information that you know, the procedures that you follow, and the psychological factors like um, um, pushing to get to your destination airport, things like that. So the one that I focused on my research is information known. The current icing product and forecasted icing product, or SIP and FIP, is a graphical display that is shown on the Aviation Weather Center's page. This is so pilots can look at this and obtain knowledge about the probability and severity of SLD before they go and fly. This uses the numerical model output, which is 13 kilometer resolution, combines that with satellite imagery, surface observations, and pilot reports. The FIP does the same thing, except it provides information 12 hours into advance. So the point of this research was to find an environmental condition that is conducive of SLD outside of liquid water content and droplet concentration, which currently is the main thing that we have to forecast this. Unfortunately, the models don't forecast this very well because water changes uh, so dramatically in such a small amount of space. Our hypothesis was that um, we can find the aerosol concentration and then base the forecasts off of that. The fewer the aerosols in the atmosphere, the more likely the presence of SLD. We use the planetary boundary layer as a line between where there should be more aerosols in the atmosphere and where there should be less aerosols in the atmosphere, and then compared it to a field campaign, which happened in 2019 over the Midwestern area, for in-cloud icing and large drop experiment. We were hoping to see more SLD above the planetary boundary layer than below it. So this is the results for the aggregate data. And uh, unfortunately, there wasn't a pattern between the location of the planetary boundary layer and the uh, amount of SLD observed and that compared to the amount of no SLD observed. So I, I made more graphs in which I restricted the data that we were looking at to uh, take away as many variables as we could. For example, I removed all the information that was colder than negative 20 degrees Celsius. That way we weren't looking at convective clouds. But actually the data we were looking at was getting uh, even, even less to, to what we were hoping to see. So then I moved down to the individual case studies. This is a, a map of the Midwest. The areas of black are areas of SLD, and the areas of gray are areas of, of no SLD, essentially. And um, as you can see, there, again, is not a pattern between that planetary boundary layer and what, what we are seeing with the, our data. So we think one of the main errors was that we didn't take into account the geographical factors, such as um, the lakes or the cities, like there's going to be more aerosols above the city of Chicago than there is above the lake. Also, the sample size was relatively small. It was just one field mission. For future research, our, our revised hypothesis is to take account the geographical features and also take into account the advection of aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, though it may also be possible that locating the concentration of aerosols will be just as difficult as locating the liquid water concentration and droplet size. So the main step that we are doing is moving SIP and FIP from um, currently the WRF wrap, which is 13 kilometers, to the RRFS, which is three kilometers. And that will increase the spatial resolution, which will hopefully increase the accuracy of it as well. So the NTSB's review for overall 2019 accident causes is this graph here. 
and um, icing is that tiny, tiny sliver at that bottom. That doesn't mean that icing accidents don't happen, it just means it's a very small amount of, of accidents that do happen in general aviation. In addition to that, we are looking um, within human factors, within SLD, and then within uh, only the, the knowledge known for decision making, and then we're just uh, focusing on SIP and FIP. This may seem a little disheartening, but actually I think it's the opposite. When we make our problems small enough, we make it so our odds are better at fixing that problem. When we fix that problem, it improves the overall greater safety. And as you can see, safety is steadily increasing. Um, I'd also like to thank my mentor, Alex Rugg, for helping support me and um, just guide me along and everything. Uh, any questions? Jeez, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was just curious, um, so you said that you were focusing aviation on like non-commercial or military. Is that because those, maybe this is a sweeping generalization, but are those planes larger and therefore not experiencing that same thing or you just wanted to kind of hone your study in a little bit more? That is a good question. Uh, actually, it's not because the airplanes are larger. Frequently in general aviation, we have big airplanes for example, the C-130 at NCAR is a general aviation airplane. Um, it has more to do with the procedures because the military and commercial airliners are very strict with what they're doing. Somehow that makes them substantially safer. They also fly at really high altitudes as far as airliners go. Honestly, if I knew why the safety was so significantly better for airliners and military, or if anyone knew, we would probably have more safe general aviation pilots as well. But. It's, it's kind of a mysterious area of, of question. Interesting, thank you. <laughs> yeah, very nice presentation and interesting case actually application for what we do here. So I was just wondering from the aerosol perspective, so you were saying that you need the very clean conditions. Do you know what the threshold for the number of concentrations of aerosols are? Oh, and if there is a sweet spot question. somewhere in this free troposphere where you have both very clean conditions and enough super saturation, I guess, to make these cases? It's a really good question. Jeez, I, I, um, when I was looking at the graphs at some point, I saw something kind of like that where I was seeing um, like this, this big point, uh, but I wrote it down and discarded it, and I thought that's probably nothing. <laughs> so I, I don't honestly know what that would be. Any other questions? You can check online too. See if we, need, we have any Slido questions. I have one. Um, were you disappointed in not finding the results uh, that you originally, when you started off looking for, that, that it didn't show what you wanted to see? Like, what was your process and, and how you handled that? Uh, I actually was a little disappointed, but the more I thought about it, it makes sense that these results are what they are. If it was that easy, if um, there was more SLD above the PBL than below it, then that would be so easy for pilots. You just descend, you get out of it, but in all these accident case studies that I was reviewing, frequently the pilots would descend and it would get worse. So um, yeah, I, I was disappointed, but I started to feel better when I thought about the fact that we are still moving forward and the fact that we know that this hypothesis didn't work out means that we can make better, more uh, informed hypotheses in the future. Yeah, that's great. And then, you know, I think everyone in this room also agrees that, you know, you jump into a project doing research and not always do you find what you're started off looking to find and but that's an answer for you too you know it, it makes it so you can switch direction in the future and look at other things so yeah thank you for that answer thank you jerry mm -hmm.